interesting, my colleague Milena. Um, I don't know, Andy, whether you wanted to just say a word about other treats in store this semester before we kick off. It's Andy, we owe to Andy the, the organisation of this whole series. Thank you, uh, Richard. I'd be more than happy to. So um, everything has been uh, either tweeted out or is available on the, the Law School website on the events page. So that's law.ed.ac.uk. Um, I'm terrible at remembering dates. Uh, so most of our seminars this semester, when they happen, will happen at the same time. Uh, but the next one is an exception. Jonathan Simon uh, will be um, coming to talk to us um, about various things, but ending on the theme of defunding of the police. Um, this is a real test of my memory. I've organised these and, of course, have completely forgotten who I've been speaking to. Uh, James Chalmers and Fiona Leverick will uh, be the third in the season, um, and they will be talking on their work on the Scottish um, jury survey. Um, and then you, Mo, um, at SOAS will be joining us in the last of this semester's uh, sessions, that's towards the end of November, um, and she'll be talking on the construction of guilt through the dossier used in the Chinese criminal justice system. Uh, we're in the process of organising an exciting um, set of seminars for next semester. Um, I see that Moitra is one of the people that we're speaking to about that. She's here in the audience today. Um, uh, we're also going to be having a, a seminar on rap uh, music as criminal evidence in the in the criminal justice system in England and Wales. Uh, but as and when those get fixed, we'll um, announce details of those. Uh, so with that, thank you very much, Richard, and I'll hand back to you. OK, hello. Um, so I'm going, going to just show myself for a minute and then um, naturally switch off alongside everybody else when I hand over to Milena, which will be very, very soon. It's great to see so many people, 56 at the last count, from all over. Um, it is indeed a kind of compensation of our strange circumstances that we can welcome people from far and wide so readily on these occasions, so welcome. And um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Milena Tripkovic today, who's going to be talking um, about citizenship sanctions, which is her, the work that she's currently engaged in. Um, as many people will know, and I'm sure it's why many people are here, Milena is the author of an important book in 2018 on punishment and citizenship, which places the whole question of felon prisoner disenfranchisement in the wider framework of the obligations and entitlements of citizenship kind of clearly reminding us that this is a matter not just of punishment but of politics properly so called and now her her current work extending those considerations is on citizenship deprivation as sanctions or other kinds of tactics against certain persons and groups in the world in which we currently live, but with, I'm not going to try and attempt to say anything further about that, but rather to hand over to Milena right now. Welcome, Milena. Thank you. I think Milena's going to speak for about 35 minutes um, or thereabouts, and then we should have about the same time for discussion. So, floor's yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Andy, for the lovely introductions, and um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm, uh, had I known that so many of you will be there, I would have baked something or done something else, but it's, uh, it's properly a pleasure to see um, so many nice names that I know or will get to know, hopefully. And um, as Richard said, today I'll be talking about uh, mostly citizenship deprivation. Um, and the title of the talk is Transcending the Boundaries of Punishment on the Nature of Citizenship Deprivation. Um, just to say in the beginning, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of slides or PowerPoints, so if for the majority of talk it will be just me, and then at some point I will share a table to uh, kind of help you get um, around what I'm talking about more easily. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll start by saying that um, what I'm presenting is actually a pretty much written paper that I'm currently in the process of revising. So I think it's an excellent moment for me to present it because um, the feedback uh, on this would be very much appreciated. And it's not only about the paper, the paper is just um, a part of a bigger project that I am currently working on and which is still kind of very much in my head only. Um, 
it's uh, a part of an ongoing research interest, um, interest which um, Richard, Richard alluded to, uh, which looks at the relationship between, on the one side, criminal conduct and on the other, various restrictions uh, to citizenship. And kind of the, the big question that interests me and which I'm trying to address in this research and other uh, pieces that I've written or which I plan to write um, is the question of what is it that remains of citizenship, of citizenship status, once a person has been convicted of a criminal offense. So that's kind of my big question. And the question is actually the question on the compatibility between uh, basically being a criminal offender and being a citizen at the same time. So I'm examining the extent to which these two um, roles, if you will, or statuses are compatible. Um, and the motivation behind this paper and, and other research as well is that um, there's a rising number of um, European and not only European countries which permit uh, citizenship revocation. Um, however, at least in my opinion, there's still no solid understanding of what stands behind these restrictions, um, why they are imposed, or and most importantly for me, is whether they can actually be justified. So today I'll be talking about um, citizenship, citizenship deprivation, and the paper has three aims, and that's actually how it develops as well. The first aim is to study European policies uh, on citizenship deprivation in the attempt to establish dominant trends on citizenship revocation, but also to see um, what uh, differences there are between different countries. The second aim is to look at how these policies correspond to the key principles of punishment. And in a second, I'll explain what I mean by key principles of punishment. And the third aim is to try at least to point out, if not really conclude entirely, what might be the legal nature of citizenship deprivation? Is it punishment, as is usually considered, or is it actually something else? And as a quick kind of spoiler to, to the end of the paper, the argument that I actually develop in this paper and in my other work is that um, what contemporary countries are really trying to do by imposing these kinds of restrictions is something else than merely punish um, the citizen. Um, what they're trying to do is reprimand the citizen for failing in their citizenship role. And the important implication of this is that in the normative sense, penal theory as we currently uh, have it and know it, is pretty much incapable uh, of helping us decide whether such restrictions are justified. So that's kind of the big argument that stands behind the paper and my other work. Okay, so to just briefly explain how I developed this argument. First, I'll talk a little bit about the background of citizenship restrictions. Uh, then I will present the findings of the empirical study which I conducted for this paper. And then finally, in the end, I will discuss the implications of this for our understanding on the nature of citizenship deprivation. Okay, so in terms of background, I already kind of pointed out to it and you will all be, all be familiar with this, that in the last couple of decades, there is a noticeable trend um, in Europe and outside of Europe, but in Europe, I would say almost predominantly towards kind of reinventing legal provisions, which ban citizens from their polities for the kind of conduct that uh, such polities consider unacceptable. And I use the word unacceptable because um, I use this vague word intentionally, and I'll explain in a second why. And you will all be, well, those of you from, who are from the UK will be um, aware of the UK, very restrictive UK rules on citizenship deprivation. But there are many other countries in Europe that um, do something similar. And they include um, Germany, France, Italy, Netherlands, and others. And outside of Europe, we've also seen examples of um, increasing, uh, uh, increasing attempts to restrict uh, citizenship rights, and such changes have occurred in, in Canada, Australia, and Israel, among other places. And it's not only that countries have these legal provisions, they have, they have been using them um, uh, as well. Um, and I would say, obviously, the data is not uh, that available for many other countries, or, or at least it's not directly available to me. Uh, but I would say that UK has definitely been using uh, these uh, denationalization powers. Um, and as a result, dozens of UK citizens have, been, um, have uh, lost their citizenship in the last few years. And obviously, these changes, and they are, they are changes, and they have been happening in the last um, decade or so, um, 
bring about many questions and the questions amount from why this is done, why it's done now, uh, and uh, to the questions of whether this is at all acceptable. And while academics mostly agree that uh, legislators have introduced such provisions or that the reasons for their introduction have been to respond to the rising feelings of insecurity that are caused by uh, the globalization of, a terror, of the terrorist threat, um, something that's uh, uh, called uh, securitization of citizenship. Um, we also know that uh, such restrictions end up being used against a very determined uh, segment of the population. And these are the people who have a kind of an association with another state. There might, they, they might be people who have another citizenship, people who have been uh, born abroad, who have uh, acquired their status through, through the process of naturalization, or they might only be people who are in one way or another linked to another state, for instance, through their, uh, through their ancestry. But it is always, in almost all cases, uh, a person that has an attachment to another country, whether this attachment is active or whether it's just presumed, it's always someone who's kind of different from the rest of the population in this way. So while we know, or we are at least guessing why these provisions have been introduced, what we know less is what is their legal nature. And when I say legal nature, I'm actually referring to their place within the system of sanction or system of legal reactions of a given state. I would say that academics kind of mostly gloss over the nature of um, citizenship restriction. They consider it to be a form of punishment. And I would, I actually see where this is coming from. This is intuitively very appealing. Citizenship deprivation is a very harsh sanction. Um, and obviously we know that the harshest sanctions are used to respond to uh, the most serious of crimes. And then logically we assume that citizenship deprivation must be a form of punishment. But I think this is kind of um, running a little bit uh, too fast. And I think this is a question that um, should not really be neglected because if it is not a penal practice, if it turns out not to be punishment, then the justification for this uh, sanction will not, in, not depend on how well it can achieve the aims of punishment, but will um, depend on something entirely different. Um, it will depend on how much it coheres with another form, uh, not, not, uh, sorry, with another normative framework, which we currently don't have. So that is the important implication. If it's punishment, then we have already the, uh, a normative framework against which we can measure its justifiability. But if it is not, if it's something else, that then the decision whether it's justified depends on normative framework, which we currently don't have. And that's what I'm trying to do in the last part of the paper. But before I go to the last part of the paper, I will just briefly try to present the empirical data based on which I then uh, uh, base the rest of the paper. So because I'm in Europe and because I was interested in European policies and because there's actually quite a lot that we already know about, for instance, the US, um, I was curious about discovering um, the nature of citizenship provocation in Europe. And for that reason, I've examined the policies of European countries. Um, in the attempt, as I say, to assess the extent to which they correspond to principles of punishment. Um, and the, under the kind of this idea of principles of punishment, I think of these principles as those principles that secure that only those who have perpetrated criminal offenses will be punished to the extent to which they deserve. And I think this is kind of pretty straightforward. There's nothing um, problematic about it. But to Kind of figure out what these key principles are, I kind of move away a little bit from the classical formal definitions of punishment such as hearts um, and focus on something else and that's the principles which um, are more or less those fundamental ideas that contemporary punishment in liberal democracies must conform to um, in order to secure that the values on which punishment uh, hinges are genuinely pursued. And then this is how I go back to this kind of idea that only those who have perpetrated crimes are punished to the extent to which they deserve. So in the paper, I focus on five of these principles. They are legality, fair trial, individual responsibility, proportionality, and equality. And I will um, define them a little bit later. But just to kind of explain uh, what the study entails, 
I have um, analyzed current legal provisions in 37 European democracies. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you access to the table just in a second, but just before that, I want to explain. So it's 27 plus one EU country, so 27 uh, EU member states, the UK, and then um, four countries that are in the uh, that are attached to the EU economically, so Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Switzerland, and uh, a bunch of other random countries that currently hold uh, EU candidate status, including mine, so Serbia, Albania, North Macedonia, Montenegro, and Turkey. So you can see that it's a pretty, diver pretty diverse uh, sample. Um, and my, my kind of guiding idea was that all of these countries are members of um, Council of Europe. Um, and for that reason, they are to be considered democracies. But I would say that it's a pretty kind of, um, it's a mixture of developed and less developed democracies. In any case, the first finding that I had is that all of these countries um, permit citizenship revocation. But I have uh, focused only on those countries which allow for involuntary loss of citizenship. So loss that is contrary to the perhaps desires on, or interests of the citizen who ends up losing the citizenship. And within this kind of narrower group, I was interested in, in, in an even more narrow group. Um, I was interested in cases of citizenship deprivation on grounds which I define as entailing a citizen's criminal harmful or otherwise objectionable conduct. So the definition is very vague because it includes criminal acts, but it also includes acts that are in other ways harmful or objectionable. And I'll, I'll speak about this um, in a second. So within 37 countries that were in my sample, um, narrowing down the criteria, uh, I ended up with 20 countries, meaning that 17 countries were excluded because they do not have um, these kinds of provisions. So 17 countries, which, which you'll see in, in just a second, uh, do not have provisions which would take away citizenship based on the fact that uh, the citizen has engaged in crim criminal harmful or otherwise objectionable conduct. Within the 20 countries in this group, um, a distinction between them, that I would say the, the clearest distinction between them, um, is uh, the conduct that leads to citizenship provocation. On the one hand, you have a group of countries which denationalize based on a criminal conviction. So in these, group, in these countries, you can only impose citizenship provocation if a person has been uh, convicted of a particular criminal offense. While on the other side, you have countries in which um, the foundation for citizenship deprivation is a conduct which is not criminalized. So it's conduct which seems to be wrong or harm, harmful in some, some way, but these countries do not require that the citizen has been uh, criminally convicted. So the first case I think is pretty much straight, straightforward as a criminal conviction and as one of the consequences of that criminal conviction, your citizenship gets revoked. Uh, but the other uh, case is much more um, dubious because um, it responds to conduct that is defined in various ways, and I'll talk about it in the second, but um, legal provisions make reference to things such as acts detrimental to the state, its reputation, its interests, lack of loyalty, lack of allegiance, and so on and so forth. So in all of these cases, it's uh, really not uh, necessary for you to um, actually be convicted of a criminal offense. And there is a, obviously a group of countries in which these two, uh, these two uh, methods of revocation are mixed. So you have a group of countries which basically use both criteria. So to kind of simplify this, I call uh, this cr crime-like conduct. It's crime-like because um, it's, uh, I want to indicate the lack of an explicit legal provision which prohibits it. Prohibits it. Okay, so to avoid torturing you any further, I'll just try to um, share this one um, table. Um, let me just see if I can actually share it. Okay, so the table um, actually, and and you, if if you can shout or anything, if if, if the table can't be seen, um, the table just basically summarizes um, the findings. So at the end of it, 
I'm just trying to fit everything. Let me just um, see. Uh, so at the end of it, you can see the countries that have no restrictions. So the, 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 the 17 countries I've said um, have no restriction whatsoever. And then in the upper part of uh, the table, you can kind of already see the findings. So I'm, I've given you, um, uh, I've listed the countries that have the restrictions and I've listed the five uh, key principles of punishment above. So where you see the gray area, uh, that means that the country is actually not abiding by the principle. And the white areas actually show you that the country is um, in full respect of the principle. So I'll just leave the, the, the table there uh, for you to, uh, to see for a while um, as I go through the findings. Okay, first I discuss the principle of legality and the principle of legality um, uh, actually says that what constitutes prohibited conduct must be known to the potential offender in advance and it must be defined as precisely as possible. So it's a kind of a combination um, uh, of the fair warning and maximum certainty principle. Um, the uh, keep the principle secures that um, a punishment is only imposed for a crime and not another kind of human conduct. And that, as I've said, it's, uh, it's uh, stipulated in the most detailed well po way possible so that potential offenders uh, can know that it's prohibited and that they shouldn't engage in it. So when I looked at examined countries, I have um, found that more than a half or rather 11 of European countries adhere to this principle as they base the nationalization on a perpetrated crime, as I've just said in, in, in uh, a second ago. So when you look at the crimes uh, that are used as the basis for, uh, for denationalization, um, you will often find reference to things such as crimes against the states, crimes against public authorities in, these in the countries that are monarchies, crimes against uh, royal families. Then crimes against the constitution, security, um, humanity, various forms of participation in terrorist offenses. So I would say that in, in, in the majority of these crimes, there is a very notable kind of public element. Um, you, were, you will almost never, with I think the exception of crimes against humanity, um, find uh, a crime that is against, uh, against persons. Um, and in some of these countries, in, in, these, um, uh, in these 11 countries, you will uh, find that revocation may only ensue that, uh, in, sorry, may only ensue if the offender was additionally sentenced to a particular term of imprisonment. So it's a combination between two criteria. One is the, the conviction for a specific crime and the other one is a sentence of a particular, usually duration, because it's usually imprisonment. Now you will see in the table that there are actually only six countries that are white. And this is because of these 11 countries, five countries use additional revocation grounds which belong to the other group of crime-like behavior, which I will now explain. So this is why only six countries are very strict in, in, in adhering to the principles, principle um, of legality. Um, remaining summer countries, and then obviously five of those countries that I've actually already mentioned, undermine the principle of legality in that they uh, uh, allow uh, citizenship revocation for acts which do not constitute crimes. Um, so to say this more precisely, uh, in these countries, a criminal conviction is not a precondition for citizenship revocation. So it may actually be that it's either uh, the conduct is not criminal at all, so it doesn't exist as a crime, or that it may amount to a criminal offense, but the wording of the norm is such it, that, that it does not it does not refer to a particular criminal offense. So the underlying behavior is either not a crime or it might be a crime, but the existence of the crime uh, is not established in a criminal process as the criminal conviction is not necessary. And an additional problem in these, the second group of countries which, this, which um, revoke citizenship for uh, a crime-like conduct is that revocation grounds are extremely vaguely postulated. Um, and thus permit a high degree of discretion. So for instance, countries would invoke um, definitions such as being linked to or a member of a military or terrorist organization or acting in interests of another country or failing in fidelity or loyalty to your own country or acting against your country's interests and reputation. So I think it's fairly obvious 
uh, how much discretion this actually leaves to, um, to those deciding on citizenship deprivation. Okay, so that's the principle of legality. Only six countries in Europe abide strictly by the principle. I now move on to the fair trial principle. And this principle secures that punishment um, shall not ensue without a court judgment, uh, which follows a process to ad that adheres to a number of principles. And these principles are very well known, but I just mentioned a few. Presumption of innocence, appropriate standard of proof, right, proof right to a legal defense, right to an appeal, and so on and so forth. Obviously, the fair trial principle or the fair trial principles, if you will, um, reduce, reduce the risk of discretionary application of law and they actually make sure or they're there so that the offender can particip participate meaningfully in a process which may conclude by imposing a very strict uh, sanction such as citizenship deprivation. So among my 20 countries that have these rules, there, is there are only four countries in which the decision to denationalize is made in the judicial process, while in the rest, in the, the rest 16 of the countries, the decision is made in an administrative process that is conducted by the executive. So only in four countries uh, does your citizenship get revoked through a decision of a court following a judicial process. Now, there's an important distinction, obviously, between the remaining 16 countries. Uh, between those countries where um, the revocation follows a criminal conviction, as Efta said, and those in which it's for a non-criminal conduct. Because in the first case, at least, the existence of the underlying conduct, in this case a crime, is established in a judicial process, even if the sanction is then made in a separate protest that is conducted, uh, that is administrative in nature. So this is obviously much better uh, for the rights of, uh, of offenders. Um, but I think the rights of offenders are even in this situation much more limited than they would be if they were exposed to a different kind of punishment, because um, the decision to punish them, or rather the, the, the criminal sanction itself, is imposed in a process that is completely separate from the process in which your guilt was established. So it's, again, the, right, the rights are much better res respected, but it's a very atypical uh, thing to do if compared to the normal, as I would say, criminal process. Okay, um, principle number three, and I'll just have a sip. The third principle is the principle of individual responsibility. That's very straightforward. I think um, only those who are the authors of criminal acts may be punished, and to be criminally liable, uh, lawbreakers must satisfy stipulated elements of both actus reus and mens rea. And obviously, this is a problematic principle in the sense that it's sometimes very difficult to ascertain um, whether someone has properly authored a crime. So the question of the, contrib the appropriate contribution to a criminal offense is, is always a problem. So where do you draw the line? But this definitely means that people who had nothing to do with a crime or did not take part in it um, ought to be penalized. So they should avoid criminal punishment. Um, and this becomes really problematic um, uh, in the context of citizenship revocation because as um, those of you who are doing a lot of citizenship studies and I see you there uh, know, um, it can potentially be extended to family members of those who are denationalized. Why? Because um, denationalization in the countries that I've examined often targets citizens who have acquired their status through the process of naturalization. So they were not citizens since birth. Uh, they became citizens later in their life. And in many cases, the status of uh, uh, citizenship that they have acquired through naturalization then gets extended to their family members, um, their spouse, their children, their spouse, their partner's children, and so on and so forth. And in a sense, then they become dependents or the status becomes dependent on the initial bearer citizenship status. And to prevent denationalizations from, denationalization from being extended to family members, it would be really good if all the countries in question had a norm which prohibits the uh, extension of citizenship revocation to these um, family members. So to prohibit what is usually called derivative denationalization. This explicit prohibitive norm I could find in only seven out of 20 countries. Now, I'm not arguing that this means that the citizenship of family members will automatically be revoked, but their status is made very much insecure because of a lack of this prohibitive norm. So I would take this one, this 
this um, uh, uh, key punishment principle with a with a grain of salt, because I'm not making an argument that this means that they will automatically be um, uh, denationalized, but certainly their status is very much insecure in these in these countries, uh, because they can very easily follow uh, the destiny of the initial person who got uh, their citizenship through um, through the process of naturalization. Okay, two more principles. The fourth principle is the principle of proportionality. Uh, again, one of the key principles of punishment, which demands that the severity of punishment corresponds to the gravity of crime. Punishment should, uh, as much as possible, fit the crime and reflect its harmfulness. And I think this was the most probably the most straightforward uh, thing to establish, um, because you have 14 countries in Europe that denationalize without a criminal conviction. Um, that automatically means that um, citizenship revocation is a uh, disproportionately harsh sanction. Why? Because it penalizes for something that's not even a crime. So if you have citizen, if you revoke citizenship from someone without a criminal conviction, then it may easily mean that what they've done does not really amount to a crime. And then obviously citizenship revocation must be a disproportionate reaction to their, uh, to their uh, offense. Um, even worse, some countries such as the UK, which permit the, the nationalization, even if it leads to statelessness, uh, are, I think, giving us a prime example of how much disproportionate this is, because uh, the question is then asked, how can losing attachment to any country whatsoever be thought of as an appropriate sanction for an act that is possibly insufficiently serious to even be criminalized. So I would say without even much discussion that they're hugely disproportionate to, um, to the uh, underlying act. And finally, the principle of equality, obviously it's a very uh, a complex principle, but in, in the sense of, uh, of punishment, um, equality would seem to prohibit penal practices which arbitrarily discriminate against particular offenders or groups of offenders, um, and it, it demands that we treat similar cases alike. Um, when I had a look at um, the laws that I've examined, I saw three ways in which this principle is breached, and the, the table actually gives you a summary of uh, all of these three put together, so I haven't um, distinguished between these three ways in which the principle of, of equality is breached. So the first situation is <clears throat> that in half of the countries, um, citizenship may only be revoked from persons who have acquired it through the uh, process of naturalization. So as, as I've said just a second ago, it's people who got their citizenship later in life and not uh, at birth through the application of principles of ius sanguinis or ius soli. And this differentiates between citizens because all those who are citizens of a, of a country whose citizenship they got through the process of naturalization have a much more insecure status than everyone else who was born in the country. Um, and that's a half of countries in Europe do this. The second uh, way in which the principle of, of equality is breached, um, all countries apart from Italy and the UK um, prohibit denationalization if it would lead to statelessness. Now this is on the face of it understood as a very positive norm because it seeks to avoid statelessness, but at the same time it has its kind of negative uh, uh, bearing uh, because it discriminates simply against those people who have another nationality. And it doesn't take into account the fact that this other nationality, that the links between the citizen and his other state might be very, very weak there might be a lack of any genuine links between the denationalized person and this other state. And e additionally, uh, the citizenship of this other state uh, um, might be without any value to the person. They might be prohibited from entering the country. Uh, the country might be in a war. Uh, the country might, might be such that it doesn't guarantee for uh, any rights. Uh, so you know, the, the decision is simply made on the basis of the fact that this other person has nationality. And I say it is a positive example because it does work to prevent statelessness, but it does have uh, an upshot in, in, the, in, this, uh, in this way. And, the final, and finally, um, the last way in which the um, citizenship is, um, the principle of equality is breached, 
is um, if you look at the cases um, of citizenship provocation in Europe, it becomes immediately clear that a distinction is made between people um, who have been convicted, for instance, of similar uh, offenses, but only some of them have their citizenship revoked and others do not. Even worse, if it's a, cri if it's a case of a crime-like conduct, then it uh, becomes uh, clear how this becomes a matter of discretion because you kind of uh, pick and choose only those, um, only some of the people who have engaged in behavior that is similar to a behavior that someone else has engaged in. So citizenship revocation is always uh, a matter of discretion, which puts similar offenders, offenders in very different situations. And we don't really have, by looking at the legislation, we don't have any proper uh, guidance or any proper criteria to determine who are those citizens who should additionally be, let's say, punished uh, through citizenship deprivation uh, uh, and, and others who do not deserve such sanction. Okay, so this was um, the empirical uh, uh, part, and I, I, I hope it's it's clear, at, le at least a little bit clear, um, uh, because I've given you the table. So I'll just stop sharing um, the table uh, now, and um, because I'll, I'll move to the last part of uh, the paper, and the last part of the paper thinks about the implications of the findings for um, our understanding of the nature of citizenship deprivation. So I think from the table, the conclusion is clear that among examined countries, so 20 countries which have these provisions, there is not a single one that abides fully by the, fully by the principles of punishment. And I think the table is very clear in showing the differences both between countries, so some fare better, some fare worse, and between different principles, so some are more respected than others. Based on these findings, I propose two alternative explanations of the nature of citizenship deprivation, and I consider that one is stronger than the other. So I'll first present the less strong one. We can, I think, still think of citizenship deprivation as punishment, even though the empirical findings show that in majority of countries, it fails to fulfill these principles of punishment. We can still think about it as punishment, but as a kind of punishment which currently exists in an illegitimate form. And if the countries were to improve their policies and align them with key principles of punishment, and you can see that some countries are fairly close to this ideal, then if the countries bring these um, principles uh, or sorry, if they bring their policies in line with the principles of punishment, then we have no principled reason not to call this and not to consider this punishment. Now, I think this still leaves a big problem, even though citizenship deprivation would then abide by the principles of punishment, it would still require us to decide whether we want to impose this kind of punishment we would have to decide whether this is sufficiently, for instance, humane, whether this is uh, respectful of dignity, whether this is in general in line with modern penal sensibilities. And I'd be very curious to hear what you think about this. My kind of feeling is that we would end up thinking about citizenship deprivation um, in the same way in which we currently think about the death penalty. Obviously, the consequences are different because they do not lead to physical uh, annihilation of a human being, but they leave a person civilly dead and they leave the person um, without the, the most meaningful, politically meaningful status that they might have. So it's my opinion that even if these policies were brought in line with penal principles, the second hurdle could not be overcome, the hurdle in which we actually examine whether we want to punish people in this way. But this is not the biggest problem. I think for me, um, and it is my kind of belief that these policies should not be understood as punishment simply because they are not intended as punishment. I think that policymakers in these countries, even though probably they don't really know or are not really thinking about what they're doing, I don't think they're meant as punishment. And here is why. I think the polities have for a long time been in this business of punishment. And I think they ultimately have a very good ability to recognize that current denationalization policies fail miserably short um, of just punishment. Um, 
they simply know that what they are doing is against a lot of these key punishment principles and they continue to do it. And they know because for a long time they've been exposed to scrutiny by academics, at least, of the policies that they use. And I think it's, it's kind of naive even to think that modern states have made a mistake and done so en masse if you look at uh, all, of these, um, all of these policies in prescribing the norms that deviate so significantly from fundamental penal principles. So instead, I think, and this is the second possible interpretation that I've promised, I think that citizenship revocation is a very particular sanction that is used towards those whose citizenship qualities are suspect and whose allegiance or loyalty to the community is dubious. I think there is kind of a sui generis type of sanction, which does not really intend so much, even though this might be an effect, to punish a human being, but that they are actually intended to demarcate an unworthy citizen with, who, with whom no future citizenship association is conceivable. So a distinction is made between um, punishment on the one side, which seeks to respond to asocial acts and citizenship deprivation on the other side, which I'm not saying does not have any penal aims, but has a much more noticeable role and aim. And that is in demarcating someone as an unworthy citizen, as a citizen who's failed in their citizenship duties. So if I just talk a little bit about who these suspect citizens are, and as I've said at the beginning of the presentation, data show that the nationalization is in the overwhelming majority of cases imposed on people of foreign descent who might be very generationally distant from their own country of origin, um, then it becomes clear that the idea of unworthy citizens is very much linked to a very specific group of citizens. And this is to some extent surprising if you think about um, the, if you think about modern or contemporary Western democracies, and we know that they've been um, exposed to immigration for decades now, and then these policies are kind of uh, very recent. So the question becomes why, and I think it's not that difficult to interpret. It is, um, I think, uh, mostly to do with this, obviously, linkage between um, terrorism and migration, and in this case, it, it, it might not even be migration. So the changing nature of terrorism, in that it has become globalized, if you think about ISIS, but it's also become localized in the sense that our own citizens are now perceived as terrorists, gives a pretty good explanation of how these policies came about. So I think the purpose of contemporary citizenship deprivation may only be understood in the context of modern multicultural societies and whose understanding of the notion of outsider has actually been shaped by decades of immigration where those whom we have once considered as outsiders have become insiders. And I think that citizenship deprivation is just one of the signals uh, which, and I'm quoting here myself, um, denounce an individual as failing to live up to the required citizenship standards, end of quote. And for some behaviors and some citizens, it seems that conventional punishment does not suffice and more drastic sanctions are thus imposed. So where does this actually leave us? If citizenship deprivation, as I've said in the beginning, is not to be understood as punishment, and I've I think I've given sufficient reason, reasons to at least doubt that this um, should be understood as punishment. If it rather strikes at the core of belonging to a polity and denounces a lack of desired citizenship qualities, then this means that we have to look for a normative, um, for a different normative frame within which we can try to understand, understand it. If it's not punishment, penal theory won't help us. And it's my argument that to understand if citizenship revocation is justified, we really have to do, what we really have to do is engage with abstract ideas on the meaning and substance of citizenship in contemporary democracies to determine which conditions or which qualities might legitimately be required of citizens, which virtues, if you will, they must possess in contemporary polities so that they can have unhindered access 
to their membership status? And I think this is a very big question. And the question is additionally um, made more complex by the fact that these requirements might be very, very different in different democratic polities, um, based obviously on the number of factors which determine the most important values within each given polity. So there, I'm assuming there might be a lot of similarity across democracies, but also a lot of difference. And I think obviously establishing this norm normative framework and what it means to be a good citizen um, and the extent to which this might be justifiable goes well beyond this article, which I'm now uh, almost done presenting. I can currently only say that the, we don't really have a very solid understanding of the duties of contemporary citizens if, if they have any duties. And I'm talking, not talking about duties such as paying taxes or you know, going to the military in those countries where it exists. I'm talking more about kind of the substantive qualities, which you, you obviously must have if you are to have access um, to your citizenship. Um, so we don't really know currently what is it that we owe to our polities and what is it that our polities might require from us. But I, I would like to conclude by um, proposing the following, and um, it's, it's not an easy proposition to make, but I think it, it does make some sense. I wouldn't say it's preposterous to say that citizenship is not merely a legal concept. Citizenship actually means something today. It has a substance and we do have our roles to play in our polities. And I think our performance of our roles very much influences other citizens. So what I'm saying is that there actually may be limits. Limits may exist as to we, what we might do to others, to our co-citizens and still enjoy being considered equal members of the polities. And I think these limits, if they exist, they are probably very, very far away from what contemporary democracies do uh, in their uh, citizenship revocation norms. So they're very far away from what contemporary countries actually do and the kinds of behaviors they base their citizenship deprivation on. But I, th I don't think it's, it's not inconceivable that some of us might be such bad citizens that it would be kind of unjustified to impose co-citizen links and associations um, with others in the polity. And please note that I'm not proposing that such restrictions would be necessary in contemporary polities, but I think that there are valid reasons to think that they might be justified. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Milena. That was fascinating and alarming in roughly equal measures to me. So I'm sure to lots of other people, wonderful. Um, so we are very much looking forward to <clears throat> hearing from lots of people. There are kind of two ways in which you could track my stroke Milena's attention, uh, I would say. W one is that you um, pop a, a, a comment in the comments panel and we'll try to respond to it. The other is to raise your digital hand and we'll attempt some form of multitasking way of trying to keep track of those comments and questions. So um, please. I'll just say sorry I'm going to stop the recording at this stage as well because it gets too complicated for including everyone in the recording but uh, thank you all um, so this part's unrecorded. Great.